Uh, good morning, New Hope Church, and I'm so sorry about that technical snafu. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of dropping off some care packages and um, other things other members had prepared. We provided snacks and masks some hygiene supplies, and we were joined by another group um, from Royal Oak that brought blankets that you could wear. Uh, three, three young women had sewn fleece blankets so that you could you know, stick your arms in it. They had little pockets for them as well. Another group brought hot food, another person laid out some warm clothes. So by 2 p.m., um, a lot of people had shown up to help, which surprised me because when I got there at 1.30, it was just me waiting with one other person. That person um, who I talked to um, said that he was there because he was hungry, hungry for some good warm food and some kind company. And he confirmed for me that I was waiting in the right place and, and we waited together. I tried not to show it, but I was nervous. Not because of the guy, because he seemed kind enough. And then I gave him the up and down once over. And he was wearing ski boots over his shoes. And I figured if I needed to, I could definitely outrun the guy. I was nervous uh, because I was afraid that we wouldn't have enough volunteers to offer meaningful help. Um, I wasn't sure if the things that our church prepared would be enough to really um, be worth it for people making the trek over. And then a lot of people, as I shared, began to arrive, and um, I saw that I was just a part of a bigger team. And then I got nervous because I thought maybe not enough needy people would gather. Roosevelt Park, where the outreach was held, is in the middle of nowhere. Most people wouldn't want to walk all this way in the freezing cold. Maybe we would just have to pack it all up and go home. But it was weird. Sometimes a dozen, dozen birds might be in a tree and we don't notice until they all go flying off at the same time. And there were dozens of needy people surrounding us and I didn't realize it until they all suddenly started walking towards us. Maybe some of them wanted to wait until there was enough of a crowd to grant them some anonymity. But um, all of a sudden, a bunch of people came. And the funny thing is, uh, as I was leaving, I noticed that there was a person that was with us the whole time. What I had thought was an abandoned bright tent about 100 feet distance under a tree was, I realized, actually a sleeping bag with a person inside it. I only realized it when I began to see movement and then saw a person emerge. I share this because sometimes, sometimes we are afraid when we show up to church. We're afraid that things will be a little bit sad, maybe a little bit lame, because we're not sure who else is going to show up. But friends, I'm learning to have faith. There are people who are committed, and they'll be there. And there are people who know that they're needy, and they'll be there. And God, God is already before us even though we sometimes have a difficult time recognizing God's presence. But as we get going, God joins us, and we will realize that God was with us the whole time. So have faith. Know that you are a part of this community that hungers for God. Know that God is with us. morning, church. Um, before worship, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, God, will you join us in this place this morning? Um, God, uh, you expect us not to be perfect, but you expect our hearts to be willing in, in, in all things, whether we serve, whether we uh, humble ourselves in front of you and others. And, and God, as we continue to press against all the things that the world tells us to strive for, as we continue to um, drive sin and, and, and earthly desires out of our life, may we just gain a, a deeper understanding of your word, a, a, a deeper connection to you, and, and may we uh, realize that um, truly there are greater things in store for us. So Lord, as we as we press now into this time of um, worship, as we sing these songs, may 
Um, may our hearts just be glad and may we rejoice in the fact that we are constantly dwelling in your spirit and constantly um, in your plan, in your perfect plan that you have, um, in, that you have uh, put before us. So Lord, um, just once again, may you just be with us in this place. May you be with us in our small rooms, in our, um, in, in our living rooms, in our whatever, whatever space we may be in. Lord, just occupy our hearts and, um, and, and stir us to, to worship you now in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is Jesus, you brought heaven down. The sin was great, your love was greater. The work could separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name hold you fell torn before you silence the bones of sin and grace the heavens are roaring praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no of Christ to one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Jesus also be with you. It is a blessing to say the name of Jesus. When I say and when I hear his name, I am reminded that I am loved, I am rescued, and I, along with all who put their faith in Jesus, are promised eternal life. So today, as we celebrate communion, May we remember all that Jesus is for all of us. What I received from the Lord, I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. 
and he broke it after he had given thanks and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we receive the bread and the cup, we remember that God is both generous and merciful. Let us receive by faith the body and blood of Jesus. Let's take together. And let us pray. Jesus, we need you for a thousand different reasons because we have a thousand different hurts. Would you put your strength into us and would you apply your forgiveness over us? May we believe that you will provide all that you promise. May we be able to receive all these things in your powerful name. These things we pray in Christ's name. Today, it is again my great joy to introduce to you my friend, Pastor Brian White. We were catching up on this past Thursday, actually, with a bunch of friends from seminary. Uh, we went around in a circle on Zoom, and a few of us shared about the different things we had picked up during the pandemic. One guy talked about getting on his indoor bike. Another one talked about doing push-ups. And then Brian shared that he had started baking. His favorite thing to bake is frosted sourdough cinnamon rolls. Just let me say that word again, frosted sourdough cinnamon rolls. Hmm. Um, his, uh, I was reflecting that his wife is much more blessed than um, any of ours because he's the only one um, that has uh, that passion. And um, friends, if his baking is anything like his preaching, um, I know that it will be worth it. Um, it will be made with love. Uh, prepared with skill and will be a rich and hearty blessing. Um, I haven't been able to taste that sourdough yet, but as with all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing God nourish me through the word through Pastor Brian this morning. Uh, the word that we'll hear after the reading from Hazel is a message entitled, What is the Church? Today's scripture reading from 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 3 to 9, listen to the word of God. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say, we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Armenians and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Armenians. When they reached to the edge of the camp, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the Armenians to hear the sound of the chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some of the things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning once again, and it really is a joy to be here and be able to worship together with you again this morning. Uh, this experience of being given the opportunity to worship with another church, it, it got me thinking this past month about what the church actually is. What is it that makes this community a church in the same way that my church here in Grand Rapids is also a church you know, after all, our two churches do a lot of things very differently. 
They have a different feel to them. They're made up of very different people. And that's just talking about these two churches, both of them in Michigan. But imagine if we expanded this question to include even more denominations, churches from even more diverse geographies and cultures. And you get into what is a really big, complex question. But sometimes I think it can be good to, to think about even very complex questions a bit more simply. And that's, that's what I wanted to do today. I wanted to look at an image of the church, an image of what the church does and its place in the world. I wanted to look at that together so that we could think about who we are um, as the church, as this kind of broader, huge, universal body of Christians, what that means for us to be the church together. The image I'm going to give you today is an image from the Bible. Those are the best ones after all but it's probably not a story that you would immediately relate to the church or the church's calling. But that's also why I think it could be such a good image for us to reflect on. The story is the one that we just read here in 2 Kings chapter 7. But to understand what's going on in this passage, let me first give a little bit of context, because especially these Old Testament history books, 1st, 2nd Kings, Chronicles, it, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things going on there, so some context would be helpful. So at this point, where we're kind of picking things up, at this point in the history of Israel, Israel is being invaded by the Arameans. Now, you don't need to know much about the Arameans other than the fact that they were a very, very powerful kingdom in this area and at this time. And in all truth, Israel didn't really stand a chance against them. Um as we begin the very beginning of the story here, the Arameans, they have burned and pillaged and invaded all the way to the capital of Israel, which at this time was Samaria. But more than just arriving outside the capital, the Arameans have completely surrounded the city, just completely surrounded it, and they besieged it so that no one and nothing could come in or go out. No supplies, no food, Nothing could pass through these massive lines of the Aramean army. So just imagine looking out over the city walls, and instead of seeing fields and forests, the ground is just dark with a writhing human mass, soldiers stretching as far back as you can see all the way to the horizon. The siege at this point has been going on long enough that the situation has become utterly desperate inside of the city. The people have already long since rummaged through all of their cupboards. The last powdery remnants of flour have long been carefully scraped out of the bowl. The oil jar is dry and cracking. The Bible tells us that the people were so hungry that they were paying 80 shekels of silver for a donkey's head. Now, if you're anything like me, 80 shekels of silver doesn't sound like much of anything. But just to give you an idea, the going price just before the siege for a healthy horse was 150 shekels of silver. So this, in other words, is an outrageous amount of money. They were even selling a half liter of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. That's how hungry they were. They would pay for manure to eat. There's even this horrible story of a woman who comes to the king asking him to force her friend to cook her son so they could eat him because they had eaten her son the night before. You know, when you hear something like that, it's, it's, it's sickening, it's horrendous, but this also shows you just how desperate the situation was in Samaria and how this desperation was only increasing the injustice and the evil that was already tearing apart their society. The people in, in the city, they were literally starving to death, and they were looking for any possible source of nourishment that they could find. Now, I don't want to compare lightly the profound suffering that the people of Samaria were going to to our first world problems that many of us face today. At the same time, though, I think it is important for us to recognize the extent of the suffering that they were facing, because it makes the miracle that is about to happen all that much more miraculous. 
And I think that this is also an important lesson, an important starting point for us in thinking about our place in the world as the church. It can be very easy, I think, for us to look out into our communities, to look at our our circles of colleagues and think, you know, they seem to be doing pretty okay. What can the gospel offer to people who seem so comfortable? And maybe you've even wondered about this in your own life. But the truth of the matter is, as the Bible tells us, just like the people in Samaria, we are trapped. We are besieged. We are trapped in our sins. And because of this, we also feel desperate. We feel this need for nourishment, for spiritual life. And so we seek that nourishment anywhere we can. We try to fill the voids in our lives with success, with relationships, with wealth, with security, with power, you name it. There's so many idols that we use to try to fill these voids and these needs and this hunger that we have. We look with envy upon our neighbors because they seem to have more than us because they seem happier, because they seem more fulfilled. We steal and fight and grab for every scrap of meaning and purpose that we can find. It turns families against each other. It turns society against each other. Just look at what is going on in our world right now and tell me that we are not besieged and starving and dying of hunger. We are. And again and again, we discover the universal spiritual truth that these ways of filling our hearts, they don't last and they don't work. We eat, we have our fill, but we find our hearts are still longing for more. And this deep need, this hunger, it's the root of so much injustice and so much evil. The simple truth is, and I think anyone, Christian or non-Christian alike, could recognize this fact if we really turn into our hearts and ask ourselves the truth of this question, I think we could all recognize that we are all in a desperate situation. But God has a plan. God has something in the works for the people of Samaria. So let's pick back up with the story here. The Bible tells us that there are four lepers who are sitting at the edge of the city, and they're trying to figure out what to do because They're starving too. They don't have any food either. And so here's how the Bible describes them. This is, I'm going to repeat here again, 2 Kings chapter 7, beginning in verse 3. It says, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. And they said to each other, Why stay here until we die? Verse 4. If we say, We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So, let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. And if they kill us, we die. So at dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they had reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. So what had happened? Where had this impossibly large army vanished to? Well, as we have read and we know, God happened. Right? God had told the people of Israel to trust him. They didn't. The king at this time was not one of the faithful kings, and he had led the people of Israel into false worship. But in spite of this, God saw his people suffering, and he intervened. In the middle of the night, the sleeping Aramean soldiers woke up to a terrible noise. Every single one of them heard the thundering of a million marching footsteps. They felt beneath them the very ground shaken by the force of some approaching army. And the Arameans literally went out of their minds with fear. They thought that the Egyptian army had somehow overwhelmed their lines. It was nearly upon them. And they jumped out of their tents and they fled in absolute terror. But of course, there was no Egyptian army. It was the power of God that had intervened. So this is what these four lepers saw when they entered into the Aramean camp. It was completely empty of soldiers. But all of the tents, all of the supplies, all of the food, it was all just sitting there, strangely peaceful in the dim twilight haze. And the lepers? Well, they had hit the jackpot, quite literally. 
And so they started doing what probably any of us would do if they suddenly found hordes of food and wine and gold and everything you can imagine just laying there. They started to gather up as much of it as they could. So they went into one tent, they grabbed all they could, they hauled it out and they hid it. And then they would run into the next tent and they would grab all that they could and they would go and hide that. They may be lepers, but at least now they were incredibly rich lepers. Until one of the four men suddenly realizes something. Wait, he says to the others. Wait, what are we doing? What are we doing? And I love this part. He says this is in verse 9. He says, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So did you catch it? The leprous man just realized that while they were gathering up all of these treasures, while they were eating a feast and drinking this wine, all of the people in the city, they didn't know yet that God had saved them. For all they knew, they were still surrounded. They were still besieged. God had freed them, but they had no idea. And so when they woke up that morning, they were still living their lives as if they were still imprisoned and dying in their city, right? They would wake up once again, and they would just go out just like they had the day before, struggling and scratching and wrestling and fighting for every scrap of food that they could find. And that's why this leper says this wonderful thing. He says, this is a day of good news. If you read this verse in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the leper literally says, this is a day of evangelism. This is a day of evangelism. And so realizing this, the four lepers, they head back into the city to share this amazing news of what God had done for them and for the rest of the people. Now, I, I absolutely love this story because I think it paints such a perfect picture of what the church really is, of what our experience of the gospel really is. You see, we, the church, we're like these four lepers. We aren't really particularly special. We aren't the most powerful or the most successful. We might even be outcasts in our society as they were, right? It, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we, by God's great mercy, we have come to see this fact that God has already done this amazing thing for us. God has already freed us Jesus Christ, our Lord, has already died for us and risen in glory and given us this offering of his life for us. The forces of sin and death have been driven away. The work is already done. As Christians, we know this, and we've experienced it, at least in part. We know God's love for us. We've experienced the freedom of giving our lives to him of casting down the false idols that we've devoted our lives to, that have sucked our life away. But the rest of the world is still living as if it is besieged by these same powers. The rest of the world is slowly dying because they have no food to eat. They are spiritually starving. But what is truly horrible about their position is that they don't need to live their lives this way. None of us need to live this way. God has already conquered our enemies. Sin and death have already been conquered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the city will never know this. The world will never know this if we don't go and tell them. And that's really what the church is. The church is these four lepers going back to the city to share the good news with the people that God has freed them. The most basic calling of the church is to share with the world that their deepest need, their deepest longing, their deepest hungers for love and acceptance and purpose and life 
God has provided all of these things and abundantly. This is the incredible task that the church that we have been given by God to go out into a starving city and tell the people that a banquet has been laid out before them. Can you, can you think of any better job to have, any better task to have than that? Whenever I was uh, a little bit younger um, and in school, one of my part-time jobs was delivering flowers. And it, it was a fantastic job. I actually loved this job because, you know, everyone likes receiving things, but flowers in particular, I, especially I remember on a Valentine's Day, that was always one of the best busiest days to deliver flowers. I love this experience of being this delivery person where you take this giant bouquet of roses into, you know, some office building and everyone is looking and kind of hoping that it will be them. And you take it to, to the person that it's for and they, they receive it and just the joy on their face. Everyone loves to receive this message. And that's, that's the amazing gift that God gives us as the church. We get to be these messengers. We didn't have to prepare the banquet or prepare the flowers. He just gives us this job of delivering it. And so we get to see that experience, that joy at work. That's part of who we are as the church. What a wonderful job it is to have. Now, I would be remiss, though, if we don't look at one more detail in this story that I think is important. In the story of the four lepers, after they go back to share this news, the people in the city, they, they don't believe them at first. They think it's a trap. They think that the Arameans are trying to lure them out. And once again, I'm struck by by just how true this can be when we as the church try to share the gospel, right? Very often the gospel is rejected, at least at first, right? And if you think about it, it's really understandable that it would be. The good news that we are sharing as Christians is absolutely incredible. It's the most incredible news imaginable. I, I think often we've lost sight of that fact. Right? This news that the God who created the whole universe loves you specifically and has died for you so that your life can have purpose and meaning and fulfillment. All of these things that you've been longing for and searching for so that you can live forever in God's presence. It's really completely unthinkable and unbelievable whenever you kind of just put it in its starkest terms and really think about what that means. So I think... Again, if you really think about it, it's easy to understand why, just like the people in Samaria, hearing that the Aramean army had just mysteriously vanished and left them with all of their food and wine and gold, it's impossible to believe. So how then do we actually share this news so that people can believe it? How do we convince them that it's true, in other words? Well, let, let me first say that the real work in this has to be done by the Holy Spirit, just as it's been done in you and in me, right? Only God can give us faith. Only God can give us the eyes to see. My father um, was often fond of saying, and I've, I've taken this to be true, you can never argue someone into loving Jesus. You just won't do it. But that being said, if we want to learn something from the example of the four lepers here, the way that we convince others that this amazing news that we are sharing is true is by showing them the riches that we've received. In other words, the best way to convince others that they are free is by living a life of freedom. But of course, living our lives in the reality that all that we need and so much more has been given to us by God, that this is a challenge for us, right? Because of this fact, because we do live in this reality that God has given us everything that we need and so much more, because of this, we are free to give and to love generously, right? We are free to love those that the city has rejected. We are free to forgive lavishly. We are free to 
work for peace because we know that the Lord has already fought for us. We are free to do all of these things that our society says are so hard and so difficult and maybe even impossible to do. We are free to do them because we know that God has abundantly given us everything that we need. But the, the simple reality is far too often as Christians, as the church, Far too often, we do what the four lepers did at first. They found themselves in possession of all of this wealth. And what did they do with it? They ran off and hid it so that it wasn't doing anyone any good. And very often, we do the same thing in our own lives. Very often, the church does the same thing. We've received the love and the blessing and the freedom of Jesus Christ. And yet so, so often, far too often, we either keep it to ourselves or even worse, we live as if nothing has changed, right? We go right back into the city and we go right back into the starving and the scratching and the fighting along with everyone else. And maybe even worse, maybe even worse than everyone else, because now, because of all of these riches we've received, we think of ourselves better than we really are. Far too often, as Christians and as a church, we fail to share this news, either through our words or through our actions. We fail to share this news with the rest of the world. And sometimes it's because we're too scared to share it, Right? It can be a scary thing to do. I understand. I, I get that. Even as a pastor, sharing this news, sharing evangelism, especially in our society, it can be scary. You don't want people to feel uncomfortable. Right? So sometimes we, we don't share it because we're scared to share it. Or sometimes we don't share it because we've lost sight of just how glorious this gift truly is to a starving city. But I think... In these cases, we need to be reminded, we need to remember the warning that the wise leper gave, right? He said, this is a day of good news, but if we are silent and we wait till daylight, punishment will overtake us. Maybe put another way, if we're silent and we never say anything, if we never act in the freedom that God has given us so others can see and believe the freedom that God has given them, If we don't do this, then we risk coming to a day whenever someone may come and ask us, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you live in a way that I could have seen and understood? So instead, like the lepers, let's joyfully take this good news out into a starving city, into a starving world, because that's what the church is, at least in part. Right? The church is a group of starving people who have experienced God's salvation, who have come to see the feast that has been laid out before them and have been given this task of sharing the good news of what God has done with others. So brothers and sisters, my church, your church, let's go and do this work together because God has given it to all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to worship together as not just a church, but as the church. And Father, I thank you for this amazing truth that what has truly brought us together is your spirit calling us in the same experience of having received um, this good news in our hearts of who you are for us and what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought us together so that we can be an encouragement to one another. And thank you, Lord, that out of the abundance of your love, you have also given us this calling to share this love, this good news, this banquet feast that you have prepared with a starving world. Thank you, Father, for all of these things. Most of all, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, for uh, offerings, please continue to use my well giving app or drop, uh, drop off the checks in the offering box on the welcome table during the next in-person worship. Thank you.
Good morning, church. Let us um, lift up our prayer at this time for ourselves and for the church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during this time of uncertainty, where the routine things we used to know are no longer the same. During this time of, of uh, unknown path, we pray that you remind us of your faithfulness to us, that during our hardest time, during our transition point, during our moment of change, that you're always with us, Lord. That you carry us where we cannot walk, and you walk beside us where we're able to walk along with you, Lord. During this time of uncertainty, separation, isolation, we pray for those who are in mourning, we pray for those who are sick, and we pray for those who are taking care of those who are mourning and sick. And we pray that we're able to reflect the love that you've shown to us through our action, through our words, and through our prayers to these people, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, during this time, as we look forward to a future that we will be uh, forming with you, Lord, we'll be at the fork of roads in many of our, of our um, walks, whether it be um, new jobs, new school, new life journey, a new purpose for a church, Lord. We pray that we seek your will first, Lord, in our quiet times, in our discussion with you, and reflect that in every decision that we make, Lord. Let us trust in you that the decision may not be the comfortable one, or what we would like to do, but the decision reflects your will, Lord, that we are faithful to you as you are faithful to us, to follow you where you lead us, Lord. Lord, remind us that you plant us here as a seed and our church is germinating through the soil and struggling to poke through to the form of where we were as a seed, as we poke through the dirt to reach the sun, to reach you, Lord, that we be transformed into a tree and then shades and provide uh, food and nour nourishment to all the people around us, Lord. We pray that during this time of uncertainty, during this time of change, that um, we pray for uh, our pastors and those who uh, preach for us and those who lead us. We pray for the session, for their wisdom and uh, their faithfulness. Uh, we, pay for the, we pray for the deacons who do the work uh, to help us all grow. And mostly, Lord, we pray for the congregation as they seek you, Lord. Uh, during this time, uh, let's be reminded that we are never alone, Lord, because you're with us. Uh, this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you would like to learn more about getting involved with New Hope Church Beyond Sunday Worship, please fill out the contact info form and we'll be sure to reach out to you. A link on the, uh, to the form can be found in the live screen description. Uh, we will be having hybrid worship on February 14th. We ask that the East Home Group uh, to worship from home uh, on this day, and we encourage all other members to come to church to worship in person. All are also encouraged to join our Wednesdays uh, at 7.30 p.m. for Bible study and Saturdays at 9.30 a.m. for prayer. We'll be studying The Prodigal Prophet in February and March. Uh, this is a book on the, uh, this is a study on Jonah's call to minister beyond his comfort zone by New York Times bestselling author, Pastor Kim, Tim Keller. Uh, so please feel free to pick up a free copy at church or email Pastor Sam to be mailed a copy. These, we, uh, these meetings will be on our New Hope Church uh, Zoom room, so please join. Uh, any member of the New Hope Church is eligible for 10 free sessions with mental health therapist Christopher Yu this year. Uh, we, may we all speak, uh, seek to steward not just our physical health, but our mental health as well in 2021. To schedule a session, please uh, email Chris at the email shown below.
And lastly, thank you for your stewardship. 2020 contribution statements are ready to be mailed out. And if your address has changed in 2020, please contact Sung Moon or Steve Shin in finance. Thank you.
People of God, I invite you to receive the benediction. In our calling as the church, God has not sent us out alone, but he has given us a community of brothers and sisters, and in truth, a vast community of brothers and sisters. Support and encourage one another in this task. But even more than this, Jesus also promised that he would go with us. Lo, I am with you always, even until the very end of the age, he said to his disciples. So receive that promise today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and go before you now and always. Go in peace. Amen. Uh, thank you, Pastor Brian, for the great word. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in this worship together. Uh, we want to just uh, look forward to hearing from Pastor Brian again on March 7th. And in the weeks up, up until then, I'll have the privilege of you know sharing with you as I usually do. Uh, this upcoming week for me is a week of continuing education. So please pray that I'll be able to continue to learn and grow as I take part in a, a Zoom conference on how to preach um, biblically and also inclusively um, it's a it's a um, it's a workshop designed around confronting racism in america as pastors uh, so please pray that that will be a meaningful time of growth for me this week and um, we'll be having our lay leaders uh, lead our wednesday bible study and saturday prayer meeting and i look forward to joining you um, in service uh, for preaching on february 14th everyone have a great super bowl sunday um, enjoy celebrating with those around you, and may God bless you each and every day.